Live from KSAT 12, the news at noon starts right now. A local family has been dealt a terrible blow as the result of a late night car crash. Three members of the family who relatives say are siblings were killed when their car was hit by an SUV. It happened on Thousand Oaks, just east of Parambito Road. As Katrina Weber tells us, relatives say the siblings were running an errand at the time. With what San Antonio police describe as one mistake behind the wheel, three lives came to a gruesome end. The car they were in rolled over and slammed into a concrete base and utility pole on Thousand Oaks near Alamo Blanco after it was T-boned by an SUV. Police say the car driver failed to yield and turned in front of the SUV, causing the crash after 10 last night. The impact caused the pole to topple, bringing with it power lines. Hours later, family members of those who were killed showed up, wanting information, but also shedding light on the situation. They say the three in the car were siblings, a 20-year-old woman and her 10 and soon to be 18 year old brothers. According to those relatives, the siblings were out for what was supposed to be a quick errand, coming to this HEB for medicine for their mother's upset stomach. They say this is only about three blocks away from their house. When they didn't return, relatives say their mother went looking for them and found the crash scene. The deaths have left them all heartbroken. The driver of the SUV was taken to a hospital to get checked out. The falling power lines also did damage to a pickup that was passing by at the time. And as they remained down throughout the morning, those lines also sent other drivers on a detour. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. New details this noon in a northeast side shooting. Police now say the victim and suspect got into some kind of fight in a parking lot before those shots rang out. It happened just after 5 yesterday afternoon on Earl Lane near the intersection of Thousand Oaks Drive and Parambito. When San Antonio police arrived, they found a victim with a gunshot wound to the stomach. He was taken to the hospital in critical condition. Police are still looking for the suspect. After years of planning, building, and collaborating, a big part of the UTSA downtown expansion is finally open. Max Massey now joins us live from the new San Pedro One building. So, Max, how's that building looking? Pretty sharp, I assume. Sharp doesn't even begin to describe it. It is so high tech. Take a look. We're right outside the server room. So many servers. And of course, you have the UTSA Roadrunner colors. Now there's new technology, new programs. And as one person put it, a new era for the San Antonio Technology Corridor. Now UTSA says this is a world-class facility and it's gonna usher in a new era of high-tech education, research, and innovation across Texas. What we're in right now is a $91.8 million facility. It's gonna house the university's National Security Collaboration Center and the new School of Data Science. It's gonna advance economic development all across our urban San Antonio core. And I spoke to so many people, heard from a lot of local leaders, and they tell me this is such an exciting time, not only for the university, but also for our community. Educate the future and prepare all of these young people to go out into the workforce and stay here in San Antonio. We want them to not go to the West Coast, the East Coast. We want them to remain here in San Antonio. Now, San Pedro One is the first project in UTSA's phased 10-year approach to accelerating the development of this downtown campus, hopefully turning into a destination for producing highly skilled professionals. We're talking data science, data analytics, and national security. And guys, as we said, this is San Pedro One, just part one of the 10-year plan. San Pedro Two is another building slotted to go in just next door. We talked to the president, he said, Hopefully, that gets completed up and running in the next three years, but you're gonna hear much more from the president and much more from local leaders and even some students about how excited they are for this and what it means for their future. We're gonna have all that coming up at five o'clock. Tiffany, David, back to you guys. And we're gonna show you a live cam shot. This is one of the reasons why all those people wanna to come to San Antonio and work here in the tech <laughs> No industry. one's leaving. This is out. it. <laughs> you can't beat it. I feel like we say this every week, or every week so far this year. It's only been a few weeks, but you get my idea. Uh, <laughs> it is beautiful out there, and uh, we're gonna see more beautiful weather going forward. Uh, right now, temperatures are sitting in the mid 60s, 65 degrees at the airport, 64 up there in Bolverde, 61 Canyon Lake, 65 Lost Maple, 67 right now in Bandera. Forecast for today, we'll take it up to about 72 by 4 o'clock. That'll be our high temperature, mostly sunny skies, light and variable winds. So you're not going to see a lot of, uh, of 
strong winds today, but they will pick up a little bit as we get into uh, tomorrow. We'll start to see more moisture surging in here, which is going to result in some fog as we get into tomorrow next couple days. So that's part of the weather headlines here. Foggy mornings Tuesday and Wednesday. Our next cold front is on Thursday. Unfortunately, it doesn't really bring us a good chance of rain. Which brings us to our next question. How long has it been since we've had a good rainfall? The numbers are pretty astounding. We're going to take a look at that for you coming up in just a bit. We'll also take a look down the line to uh, the weekend, let you know what you can expect as we head into next week and all that here in just a few minutes, guys. Thank you, Justin. It is only 100 feet of Industrial Alley. It's in the downtown part of San Antonio, and it is turning into a local artist's dream. This is Peacock Alley, just off of Broadway. Members of the community are invited to share their ideas and concepts for Peacock Alley. Selected Alley artists will receive grant funds to make their dreams of reality for the 2022 Spring Series. Centro San Antonio tells us this is about inspiration, collaboration, and economic generations. Downtown is the heart of all of our stories, and right now, because of construction and other major catalytic projects, we've had some uh, egress and some transactional and loss of foot traffic. So all of this is to really inspire and support small businesses, as well as really reclaim spaces for locals. So what better way to make memories in downtown than with locals supporting locals, and Peacock Alley is that communal space. So if you have any ideas you want to submit for Peacock Alley, in the spring series, we have a link to do so right now on our website. Just go to ksat.com. It's the second week of the new year and textile crews are back at it with road work projects. For drivers, that means there are areas you may want to avoid. Traffic Authority Stephen Cavazos explains what you need to know. It's a new week and that means we have a new week of closures. Let's tell you what you can expect as you plan your commute. Right now we do have some work that's been taking place off of Wurzbach Parkway roadway improvement. It's been uh, happening for quite a while, but we'll see that work continue from Monday, January 9th up until Tuesday, January 31st. So this is going to take us all the way into February. It begins at nine in the morning and should wrap at three in the afternoon. That's when we will see some alternating lane and ramp closures in both directions from Blanco Road to Thousand Oaks. Then on Tuesday over on I-10 on the east side of Bear County. Road work will continue. It does begin at 8 in the morning and should wrap hopefully at 5 in the afternoon. So it will be a busy time for drivers and textile crews. Expect to see a full closure of the eastbound frontage road from Cibolo Creek to Zul Road. All right, one last jump here at Loop 410 on the northeast side of San Antonio. Drilling work will continue. Now this will begin on Wednesday, January 11th and wrap on Friday, January the 13th. This is overnight, so 9 in the evening to 5 in the morning. Late night owls, early bird commuters plan ahead because you will see a right shoulder closure on loop 410 eastbound between Perrin Vital and Interchange Parkway. I just updated the list of current closures that are taking place right now. So scan that QR code. It's going to take you directly to our KSAT traffic page and it will have a full list of closures there. So plan your commute ahead of time. The Cowboys are limping into the playoffs. Not a good day yesterday. Protests in Brazil left behind destruction as some citizens took control of the country's presidential palace, National Congress and Supreme Court. We have a look at the fallout, including how many arrests have been made so far. Days after the two year anniversary of the deadly January 6th Capitol attack here in the U.S., a similar scene played out in Brazil. Supporters of defeated far right former President Jair Bolsonaro stormed several government offices demanding he be reinstated or for the current president Lula da Silva to step down. ABC's Alex Brichet reports Bolsonaro condemned the violence in a tweet, but has been claiming for months that October's election was fraudulent. Police in Brazil say they have taken control of the country's presidential palace, National Congress and Supreme Court after thousands of supporters of former President Jair Bolsonaro invaded the buildings on Sunday. The government wasn't in session, but the rioters left a trail of destruction. Bolsonaro's supporters smashing windows, throwing furniture and fighting with police in the nearly five hour uprising. Security forces fired tear gas to try to quell the violence. The people storming the government buildings in Brazil's capital city of Brasilia demanding that Bolsonaro, who lost his re-election bid in October, be reinstated as president. The far-right politician, who some call the Donald Trump of South America, has been falsely claiming that voter fraud led to his defeat, even calling for a military coup. Bolsonaro also skipped the inauguration of his successor, Lula da Silva, traveling to Florida instead, where he was during the attack. 
Many are comparing what happened in Brasilia to the deadly January 6th insurrection at the U.S. Capitol after former President Trump's defeat. For his part, Bolsonaro put out a statement calling the invasion of public buildings outside the law. De Silva has blamed the violence on Bolsonaro's repeated claims of election fraud. And after surveying the damage in his presidential offices, he called the protesters fanatic fascists. The Brazilian government says at least 400 people have been arrested. President Biden condemned the attack on Brazil's capital city, calling it outrageous and saying that the world's fourth largest democracy has his administration's full support. Alex Perche, ABC News, Washington. Outside with live camera, at least it's cold in the morning <laughs> to where you feel like it's some sort of winter time. But you can't beat that blue sky. You really can't. Uh, listen, the, the weather, I don't know how else to put it, it's just, it's kind of boring, but boring in a good way in the sense that, you're right, we get the cold mornings and the, the really nice afternoons and we'll keep it going. The aquifer is still suffering down four tenths of a foot to 636.3. In your pollen count, we got a bit of good news this morning. Mountain cedar dropped to moderate at 580. Molds are low at 270, but those mountain cedar trees are rearing up and ready to go. We're going to get some more northerly winds coming up Thursday. We'll see what that does to the counts. Uh, we'll talk about that front and what it means for our rain chances, too. Coming up. We walked outside to do some chores yesterday afternoon and the neighbors have a lot of cedar trees. Oh. And you could see just the different colors and there's that orange. I didn't even want to take a picture. I afraid I'd sneeze <laughs> later just taking a picture. So. It's like you don't even want to move because you yeah. just know they're just about to like walk very slowly. Released into the air. Uh, but yeah. it was a nice day yesterday. It was. It was. And we're thankful that Mountain Cedar's down a little bit today. And as I said, we're going to get some gusty winds on Thursday. So we'll see what that does uh, to these Mountain Cedar counts. I feel like we're headed right into the heart of it, though. So just prepare yourselves. A lot of people are already sniffling and sneezing because of Cedar. I, I want to show you the satellite picture to start. We've got some clouds down there around Corpus Christi. These are all high clouds. Not a big deal. And we're really not seeing much from here around San Antonio. So a lot of sun. Uh, this afternoon, which will allow us to rebound temperature wise. It was a little chilly this morning, uh, but not really anymore. We're in the mid 60s. Those clouds also bringing some rain to deep south Texas. There are a few showers down here uh, closer to the valley. These all stay well south of us, but uh, there are going to be a few sprinkles down here between Brownsville and Corpus Christi, I think, over the next couple of hours. And as we look at the big picture, most of Texas is really pretty quiet. That's the way it has been. Uh, just not much going on. It is the West Coast that is just really taking it on the chin right now with a lot of rain, snow, heavy, heavy rain. And there's going to be more flooding here, I'm afraid, as uh, we have that atmospheric river, just tons of moisture streaming in over California. And they need it, but not all at once. And this is going to be more flooding uh, and cause more flooding there. Seven to ten inches of, of rain potentially in the week ahead there along the coast. And uh, this is all probably going to be in the form of snow. So some very, very heavy snow uh, there in the mountains of California. As we zoom out and look at the rainfall potential over the next seven days, notice Texas is right there where there's nothing. We're uh, going to miss out by and large on any precipitation. And that's not a great thing because as you look back, we've compiled the numbers. How long has it been since we've seen a half an inch of rain? 50 days. Okay, we can deal with that. How long has it been since we've seen an inch of rain? 137 days. How long has it been since we've seen two inches or more at the airport in one day? You got to go back 452 days, all the way back to 2021. It has been a long time. Now, this is not a record number here, but uh, it definitely lets us know that we are in the midst of a drought, and any sort of rain at this point would be helpful. It's just not in the forecast. We'll go outside for you. At least the weather is beautiful. 65 degrees at the airport, 67 at Stinson and Kelly, 66 at Randolph. In the case that 12 hour forecast, we'll get those numbers up into the 70s, probably low 70s this afternoon, mostly sunny. Southerly winds start to kick in later today. That'll start to bring in a little bit more moisture by tonight. And so temperatures won't be as cold by tomorrow morning, probably falling into the 50s and that's it, not 40s like we uh, dealt with this morning. And of course, humidity will be on its way up too. already is. We're seeing dew points on the rise. They'll jump into the low 60s probably by tomorrow morning. So that combined with uh, those falling temperatures, uh, we should see some fog. So the future cast fog shows that visibility probably starts to come down as early as midnight for our southeastern counties and that fog will try to work up towards san antonio by tomorrow i think uh, tomorrow morning I don't, I don't think it lasts very long here 
Uh, but if you're south and east of San Antonio, it's probably going to be a little bit thicker and last a little bit longer tomorrow morning, and then we'll break out into more sun. Now let's look down the line. All that rain out in California, some of that energy works towards the middle part of the country by Wednesday. This is 5 o'clock. It doesn't <laughs> produce rain again in Texas, but we've got rain up across parts of Kansas and snow in Denver. There is going to be a front with this, but we miss out on the rain with that as well. Doesn't really start producing showers until it's well east of us. And then this will be a big rainmaker for the east coast and probably a snowmaker too for the northeast. Uh, just uh, too far north for us to really benefit from it. Pushes a front through, gives us some gusty winds, and that's it. So 77 tomorrow, 80 on Wednesday, our warmest day after some morning fog and clouds. Then the front comes through pre-dawn Thursday, and that brings some gusty winds with it. Cools us down some, but not a lot. 67, 68 Friday, and really beautiful weather going into the weekend. So the temperatures, you can't beat it. Uh, but as we were talking about this morning, we're going to have a real issue if we can't get more rain back in the forecast, guys. All right, thanks, Justin. Coming up, the Texans didn't waste any time firing their head coach after the season ended yesterday, and the Spurs on a strange and very tough road trip. Talk about that next. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Hey, the Cowboys would have liked to have had some positive possessions, got their starters some rest, and peeked at their phones every now and then to see if they were moving up in the playoff standings. Didn't work out that way. Nothing smooth. They didn't need their phones. First quarter, Commanders rookie quarterback Sam Howe. First NFL game as a starter. First pass, first TD, 16-yard touchdown. 7-0 Commanders after one. Second quarter, Dak Prescott throws. He is picked off by Kendall Fuller. 29 yards the other way. Pick six. Commanders missed the extra point. 13-0. Late in the quarter, Dak finds C.D. Lamb. There he is in the end zone. 15-yard touchdown. Extra point, no good. The Commanders lead 13-6 at halftime. Dak 9 and 21 for 80 yards. By the break, third quarter, Cowboys go three and out in three straight drives. Commanders score right before the end of the quarter. Sam Howell, nine yards on his own, washing up 26 after three. Fourth quarter, Dak trying to convert on fourth and one. Ah, uh -uh. he cannot convert. Cowboys turn the ball over. Cooper Rush ended up coming into the game late in the quarter. So here is your final Dallas going into playoffs with a loss to the Washington Commanders, who are not in the playoffs. 26 to six Dallas finishes the regular season at 12 and five. I mean, it's disappointing, no, no question. Uh, yeah, the timing of it is, is definitely uh, not what you're looking for. Um, you know, I, I clearly recognize that, but you know, I think it like, it's like a lot of things in life. You know, when you get kicked in the ass, punched in the mouth, you have a chance to respond. And, uh, and I have great confidence in our football team that we will respond. For offense, um, just completely not who we are. Um, I don't think I, I've seen us like that in uh, damn sure the last two years. If that doesn't make you want to uh, get ready to go in about six, seven days, nothing else will. And that was as uh, uh, thorough a butt kicking as we've had this year. That's a lot of good talk. We'll see what happens next week. So here's the way it looks in the NFC. The Seahawks and 49ers, Giants and Vikings, Cowboys and Buccaneers. That is Monday night at 7.15. Live here on KSAT 12, the Eagles get the bye. Things got all wacky for the Texans yesterday. This has to go down as the worst year for the Texans in franchise history or close to it. All the way to the end. In Indy, taking on the Colts. First quarter, Davis Mills connects with Brandon Cooks. 11-yard touchdown. 10-7 after one second quarter. Jonathan Grenard picks off Sam Ellinger. Returns 39 yards for the pick six. Nobody's going to get him. 17-7 at half, the Colts led 31-24 late in the game when Mills on 4th and 20 fires, connects Jordan Aikens, 28-yard touchdown, 31-30 Colts with under a minute to play. Mills also finds Aikens for the two-point conversion to retake the lead by one. That's the game winner. Here is your final. The Texans come back to win it 32-31. They finish 3 and 13 that makes them the second worst team in the league so that touchdown at the end at least a two-point conversion cost them the number one pick in the draft chicago will be number one and texas will be number two after the game probably before he got home lovey smith was fired as the head coach of the texans all right so here's a look at the afc playoff picture the bye week goes to the chiefs best record in the AFC, then Chargers and Jags, Dolphins and Bills, Ravens and Bengals for the wild card games. And the Spurs are on the road. This is a weird one. They take on Memphis tonight, 7 o'clock. They stay in Memphis and take on Memphis Wednesday night 
at 7 o'clock. And then they come home and take on the Golden State Warriors. And that is the big one. That's the one we've been looking forward to because they're going to play in the Alamo Dome. Matter of fact, the court is going down. It's the Fiesta Court. So it's going down inside the Alamo Dome. 50,000 plus fans for that one. It's going to be fun. So that'll be great. And don't forget tonight, it is the national championship game. The 2023 between Georgia and TCU. That thing kicks off at 630 and that will be on ESPN tonight. So go Horn Frogs. There's a lot of sports. A lot of stuff going on. Yeah. Okay. So we have the Spurs, the Cowboys. They're looking good though. Right? Ah, <laughs> okay, that's, that's good positive attitude. Okay. Now, a horror film hitting the box office with a big debut, but was $30 million in ticket sales enough to dethrone the new Avatar movie? A look at the top five films in theaters. That was more like the Cowboys, the horror film. <laughs> For the first time in 15 years, medical professionals are updating guidelines for children battling obesity. What recommendations they are making. Coming up. New video this noon from the Opportunity Center for the homeless in El Paso. It appears to show someone at a migrant welcoming center being thrown to the ground. A warning, some viewers may find this video disturbing. As you can see, someone who appears to be in a law enforcement uniform pushes the person against the windows. He then slams that person to the ground and begins handcuffing them. Another person who also appears to be in law enforcement stands over them. No word yet on what started the incident or the condition of the person thrown to the ground. In a statement, the center says the video, quote, raises our concerns for the well-being of the individual taken into custody and all the guests receiving services in our homeless programs, end quote. The U.S. Customs and Border Protection says it's investigating the incident. Meanwhile, President Joe Biden is in Mexico City this afternoon, where he will take part in the North American Leaders Summit. He is expected to discuss immigration matters with the leaders of Mexico and Canada during the event. This comes after President Biden made his first trip to the southern border as commander in chief yesterday. He is facing some criticism because he toured a migrant center but didn't see or meet with any migrants. Yesterday, Biden did, however, meet with local officials and Border Patrol agents. More than 7,000 nurses at two major private hospitals in New York City went on strike today. They say they want, quote, fair contracts that improve patient care, end quote. New York's private and public hospitals still have at least 17,000 nurses working. About 9,000 nurses reached agreements ahead of the planned strike. The rest operate at public hospitals that aren't affected by contract negotiations. New York City Mayor Eric Adams says the city is ready for the challenges posed by the strike. Fire Department EMS will reroute ambulances and public New York City health and hospitals have planned for patient surgeries. In your health headlines, for the first time in 15 years, there are new guidelines for treating children with obesity. The American Academy of Pediatrics says the goal is to help families make changes to a more sustainable sustainable lifestyle with a focus on behavior therapy. For children as young as two, that means nutrition support and increased physical activity. For teens, that could also include medication and possibly even surgery. According to the Academy, more than 14 million children and teens are considered obese. The condition puts them at a higher risk for multiple health issues, including sleep apnea, asthma, bone and joint problems, type two diabetes and heart disease. One thing a lot of parents stress about is how to make sure their child is getting as much sleep as they need. ABC's Justin Finch explains why the solution may be as simple as a different bedtime. Kids and teens need adequate hours of sleep each night to support their health and development. But meeting this number may be a difficult challenge for some families. A new study that analyzed data from 45 clinical trials found that an earlier bedtime may be the key to kids and teens getting an extra hour of sleep. The study, published in JAMA Pediatrics, showed kids who were put to bed an hour earlier than usual get more than 45 minutes extra of quality sleep. This finding was true across age groups from preschool through high school and helps debunk the idea that an earlier bedtime will only cause kids to wake up earlier. While you as a caregiver may not be able to change the time your child needs to wake up for things like school, setting an earlier bedtime could make a big difference in them getting a full night's sleep and may help you get one too. 
With this Medical Minute, I'm Justin Finch, ABC News. Tens of thousands of people across the country are now in the first week into dry January, where you abstain from drinking alcohol. And researchers say there's evidence that cutting out alcohol, even just for a month, can have benefits that last well into the year. The Washington Post reported on one study found in BMJ Open, which found that people who stopped drinking for a month saw significantly improved metabolism. Those people also shed about four and a half pounds, had low lower blood pressure and a substantial reduction in levels of insulin resistance. Medical professionals also say taking a break from alcohol can help you sleep better, elevate your mood and energy levels. Speaking of alcohol, beer drinkers are having to dig a little deeper into their pockets. The alcohol consulting company Bump Williams says beer prices, not including sales at bars and restaurants, jumped 7 percent during the last 13 weeks of 2022. The firm said prices of some popular beers, including Bud Light, Miller Light, Coors Light, increased even higher by 10 percent during that time. Breweries have had to raise prices due to inflation and the increased cost of shipping and ingredients. However, industry insiders say while people are generally buying less beer, higher prices are making up for it, with sales up about 2 percent last year. LinkedIn is seeing a resurgence thanks in part to recent layoffs in the tech and media industries. In 2022, the LinkedIn mobile app was downloaded some five, 58 million times. That's up 10% from the previous year, according to research firm Sensor Tower. LinkedIn says it has seen record engagement among its 875 million members. Meanwhile, there were 22% more posts in November mentioning open to work compared to the prior year. All of this engagement has been good for business. LinkedIn saw a 17% year-over-year revenue growth in the three months that ended in September. Well, that food and drink talk got me hungry. And I think, as we said many, many times with <laughs> weather like this, man, find a restaurant that's got a back porch or a patio or something. You can sit outside and just soak it all in. Mm, I think those are going to be pretty popular this entire week and into the weekend. We just can't lose these uh, blue skies, this beautiful weather. And I don't think anyone's complaining. I want to show you a picture, uh, this in our case, I connect showing the high clouds that are coming through today and they are beautiful. Those are cirrus clouds are about 20,000 feet up in the sky and they're made of ice crystals and they oftentimes take on that kind of sweeping movement there across the sky. It's always beautiful to see and uh, we'll, we'll see maybe a few more of those. Although the, the bulk of the cloud cover is now starting to move out and we're just going to see clear skies rest of the afternoon. Beautiful picture, by the way. Thank you so much. 65 degrees right now. Most of the state dealing with 50s or 60s. It is 77 down there in Brownsville, but just good weather all the way around for the Lone Star State. And as you look north, it's cold, but not too cold. 15 Bismarck, 24 Minneapolis, 17 International Falls. It's been cold here for a while, but it's not horrible uh, for uh, midwinter. 75 Orlando, 78 in Miami, but at, most of the country is dealing with pretty average temperatures at this point. There's no real big storm system that's going to alter that. 70 degrees at 2 o'clock, 71, 3 p.m. We'll be up around uh, 72 for a high, 65 by 6 o'clock, 61, 8 p.m., and then we're down into the 50s as we get into uh, the overnight hours. There will be some fog building by tomorrow morning. Visibility will drop down not only to uh, tomorrow morning, but also on Wednesday as well. We'll talk more about that forecast and get you set for the rest of the work week coming up in just a bit. Thank you, Justin. Take it to Washington now. The House of Representatives is just about ready to get to work today after Kevin McCarthy was finally elected speaker. ABC's Rachel Scott reports he was able to secure the position after 15 votes and as tempers flared in the House. That was easy, huh? <laughs> Republican Kevin McCarthy winning a once in a century fight, now second in line to the presidency. My father always told me, it's not how you start, it's how you finish. But it did not come easy. After more than a dozen grueling defeats. A speaker has not been elected. A speaker has not been elected. McCarthy was confident he had the votes on the 14th ballot. He fell one vote short. Matt Gates waiting until the very end to deliver the crushing blow. Gates. What happened next was dramatic. McCarthy confronted Gates. 
and then Republican Mike Rogers taking it to another level, physically held back from going after Gates. Some Republicans trying to defend the altercation. Sometimes democracy is messy, but I would argue that's exactly how the founders intended it. Even Donald Trump stepping in. Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene trying to pass her phone to one of the holdouts, the former president waiting on the line. After a 28 minute scramble, a deal. McCarthy elected on the 15th ballot, but the concessions he made to convince the holdouts could haunt him going forward. Power concedes nothing without a demand, never has and never will. One of those concessions allowing a single lawmaker to force a vote to remove the Speaker of the House. Still coming up, Avatar. The way of water has made well over one and a half billion dollars worldwide. It, its fourth week in theaters was able to hold on to the top spot at the box office. 